there's a, uh, a Woody Allen movie, I don't remember which one it is, in which someone is going on and on about uh, the, the movie as a real authority, and then it just so happens that the person who uh, wrote it is right there and corrects him. And I actually just had this uh, experience where my uh, final uh, concluding uh, uh, remark was uh, sort of drawing on some work by uh, Dr. Schnepp, who's just told me that, in fact, I've misinterpreted it. So uh, <laughs> better that I beat you to the punch. But, and I thought about changing the conclusion, but it's still kind of interesting and provocative. So I'll just, I'll just go on note right now as saying that um, my, I'm, I'm already pushing the envelope a little bit on my final conclusions, and, and now I know even more so now. Um, so that's my first caveat. The second caveat uh, is that, um, as I said, I really uh, don't know much at all about uh, dyslexia, except as I've been listening to these talks, I'm beginning to suspect that I may be a self-dyslexic myself. Um, so I, I may know more than I, I thought I did. Um, all right, so um, what I'd like to talk, do today is to talk to you about mind wandering and its relationship to uh, creativity. And I'm going to do uh, an attempt at the beginning and end to tie it in with, uh, with dyslexia. So um, there is a relationship uh, between ADHD and dyslexia, it's estimated that about 30% of those with dyslexia also have a coexisting ADHD. And what I'm going to be telling you about with respect to mind wandering is uh, very related to ADHD. It's well known that uh, one of the sort of defining characteristics of ADHD is distractibility, and mind wandering is, is clearly a major uh, aspect of that. And it's also known that ADHD uh, has been associated with creativity. So there's that connection uh, as well. Um, so the questions of my talk today is, what is the relationship between mind wandering and uh, creativity? And this may speak to a source of creativity of at least a, a significant minority of people uh, with uh, dyslexia. And I think it's really interesting to think about there may be other other mechanisms by which dyslexia is connected with creativity as well. So this may be one of perhaps several different routes by which uh, dyslexia uh, enables creativity. So let's uh, begin with uh, some uh, anecdotal um, uh, discussion. There are numerous examples in uh, over history of uh, individuals who report having um, had creative ideas while mind wandering. Um, there is the uh, classic example of uh, Archimedes, who was trying to figure out how to calculate the volume of the king's crown without melting it, and uh, was uh, sitting in his uh, bathtub. And uh, as he was sort of idly, as the legend goes, mind wandering about it, he suddenly realized that by um, putting the crown in water through displacement, he could calculate the volume. And then he had this eureka experience where legend goes, he ran through the uh, streets of Athens naked uh, in his uh, exuberation. There is also the famous example, uh, well, maybe less famous than Archimedes, but still uh, well known among at least us uh, creativity researchers, of Poincaré, the famous uh, French mathematician who um, as, uh, was stepping on a bus. And as he put it, at the moment when I put my foot on the step, the idea came to me without anything in my former thoughts seeming to have paved the way for it, that the transformation that I used in fine Fuchsian functions were identical with those in non-Euclidean geometry. So this major um, insight while mind wandering stepping on a bus. Just a couple of other examples. Uh, Carey Mullis, the inventor of DNA replication, the, apparently, he, on one Friday night in April 1983, while driving to his weekend cabin, Mullis has recorded it, suddenly struck him that there was a method of producing unlimited copies of DNA fragments simply and in vitro. And this has proved to be hugely important in terms of the study of DNA, because you can only study uh, by being able to replicate it. All sorts of advantages have been made possible. And then lastly, uh, Towns' invention of the laser, apparently, uh, the idea for the laser being dawned upon physicist Charles Towns while he was sitting on a park bench in Washington, D.C., admiring the azaleas. He yeah. suddenly realized how light could be configured into a very pure, uh, pure form. So uh, a lot of examples of people just sort of thinking idly and suddenly uh, very creative ideas occurred. Um, so major discoveries seem to occur when people have been working on a problem for a while and then take a break. Solution occurs while mind-wandering during the break 
And this is also, and I'll be coming back to this as well, and this is also an, an exciting part of, of Mark Beeman's research, it seems to be associated with an aha experience. So there seems to be sort of this connection, perhaps, between mind wandering, creativity, and the aha experience. So those are sort of the key ideas that I hope you can hold in your mind, uh, unless you're mind wandering. <laughs> um, so the goals of the present research that I want to tell you about today first is to examine uh, the relationship between mind wandering and creative incubation in the laboratory, first off. Then to assess the relationship between individual differences in mind wandering, creativity, and hot experiences. So looking at are people who are uh, inclined towards mind wandering, do they have a different relationship to creativity? And then uh, thirdly, um, and this is um, unpublished uh, research and also where uh, I'll be pushing the envelope a little bit too far, I suspect, uh, to explore the role of mind wandering and hot experiences in the actual output of creative individuals, screenwriters, and physicists. This is work you haven't heard about that. Uh, so all right, so here we go, uh, mind wandering and incubation. So in this study, we are interested in investigating the degree to which the benefits of an incubation interval in creative problem solving stem from the opportunity for mind wandering. So just to sort of bring this back to you guys, you've all had the experience of you're trying to solve a problem and you go, I need to sleep on it, right? I just need to just let my mind sleep on it and I'll come back to it. And this has been studied in, uh, uh, in research. What happens when you've been working on a problem and you take a break? Uh, and what we were interested in this study is if we fill that break with different activities, what does that do to the value of the break? So we directly compared incubation in, uh, of varying levels of difficulty. So they're doing different things. Um, and it's been shown that when people are engaging in a very demanding task, they mind wander, not surprisingly, less when they engage in a less demanding task. And so we thought if we give people sort of just the right amount, sort of the Goldilocks, just the right amount of demand to their incubation interval, this might particularly spur on creative uh, ideas. Uh, we used a technique known as the unusual uses test, where you ask people to come up with as many uses as they can think of for a common everyday object, such as a brick or a hanger. OK, so this is the way this paradigm worked. People were um, given um, the opportunity to come up with as many, unusual, as many unusual uses as they could for a hanger uh, and uh, for a screwdriver. Or, we had a number of different items, but those were two of them. Then they were given a demanding task. They had a um, rest task in which they were simply asked to just sit there idly and given nothing to do. Uh, and then they were given no break. And our, our hypothesis was that this um, non-demanding task where you're still sort of doing something but not a very demanding thing might actually produce the greatest value because this is where you sort of are stirring the pot. You're thinking but you're coming back and you're thinking you're coming back. And um, then they were given another set of unusual uses. Um, so if they had um, they were if they had the hanger and screwdriver, they um, get those again. But they also were given new items, and this allowed us to look at the benefit of the incubation interval on both items they had been working on before and new items. Okay, so we're basically what we're doing is we're giving people creativity tasks, we're giving them an opportunity to mind wander at various different levels, then we're giving them the items they worked on before and new items, and we want to see where do they get the best benefit. And what we found is, is that it was the undemanding task, the zero back task, that led to the most a substantial benefit between time one and time two in solving the items that they worked on before. So the items that they worked on before, where they had already been percolating in there, when they were given the opportunity to mind wander, that led to um, the biggest benefit. Interestingly, rest just giving them nothing to do, and this is somewhat surprising, you might have thought, well, they do even more mind wandering when they're just sitting there doing nothing. But it seems like if you give people a mildly demanding task, this may be the sort of the, the perfect mixture of um, something to do, but not so much to do, that you stir the pot and uh, get the most creative benefits. We did not see any difference for the new item. So this seemed to be specifically a benefit for incubation. So the conclusions then from this study is first that incubation effects are enhanced when individuals are given a non-demanding task relative to a demanding task, no task or no break, and we found that they mind wandered more during the non-demanding task than when they were given the demanding task. Secondly, the non-demanding task 
was associated with what I just said, with greater mind wandering. And this suggests that mind wandering during non-demanding tasks may particularly enhance creative incubation. So this means that if you want to solve a problem and you're stumped, you may want to do something like gardening or uh, the dishes, something that doesn't really require uh, a lot of fun. Okay, so uh, this next study um, looked at individual differences in mind wandering. As I mentioned, there's some research that's been done already showing that ADHD, which is known to be associated with mind wandering, um, <clears throat> can be also associated with increased levels of creativity. Um, some studies have found that people with ADHD score higher on creativity tests, and other studies have shown that people with ADHD score higher in creative areas such as music, visual arts, culinary, invention, and uh, uh, writing. Also, there's been some evidence suggesting that this um, that individuals uh, who score high on creative achievement questionnaire um, are associated with insightful solutions, but not a non-insightful creative solution. So there's sort of a suggestion that creativity may be especially associated with um, having insightful uh, kinds of uh, solutions to things. And so our prediction then was that people high in mind wandering may be particularly creative, but that this may be especially associated to insightful solutions. So we're predicting a relationship between creativity and mind wandering, and that people who mind wander may be particularly likely to solve uh, creative problems in an insightful way. So in this study, um, individuals were um, given various measures of mind wandering. Uh, this no scale known as the MA scale, mindfulness questionnaire, which is, I'll show you some of the items on it, it's negatively correlated with uh, mind wandering ADHD scale. They were given a reading task and another task, uh, a vigilance task, and they looked at mind wandering on those various different measures. And then we gave them uh, the remote associate uh, task, which is very close, uh, I guess, is your task basically closely aligned to um, the uh, task that uh, Dr. Beeman is going to be telling you about. Um, basically what happens is you give people, and I don't think I have an example, but you give people three words, all of which have a common associate, and people have to come up with the um, word that is related to all three of those uh, other words. Um, this is the uh, MOSS scale, so you can see a lot of these items are very close to mind wandering. I find it difficult to focus on what's happening in the present. I tend to walk quickly to get where I'm going without paying attention to where I, uh, what I experience along the way. Um, let's see. I drive places on an automatic pilot and then wonder why uh, I went there. <laughs> I find myself preoccupied with the future of the past. I find myself doing things without paying attention. So closely related to, uh, to mind wandering. And this is a very busy uh, thing, so let me just walk you through here. This is people's measure on the Moscow, which we're using as a measure of, um, of mind wandering. And what you can see here is, is that their accuracy on the um, rat ones that they solved without insight, there's no correlation. Um, but the more mindful they were, so this is usually mindfulness is a good thing, but in this particular study, the higher they scored on the mindfulness uh, scale, the less high, um, the less well they did in solving rats uh, insightfully. So this suggests that there may be a relationship between mind wandering and the tendency to solve creative problems in a uh, insightful manner. So the conclusions from this study is first, the performance on the remote associates was negatively related to mindfulness, but only for insightfully solved problems. And this suggests then that mind wandering insight may involve uh, complementary uh, processes. Okay, so now this last study, this is a work that um, we are, we've just um, um, completed, so we're still writing it up. And we looked here at um, the real-time um, creative ideas of two different populations of creative individuals, physicists and uh, creative writers. We had 45 physicists and 53 writers, and every day for two weeks, they completed a creativity journal where they were asked if they had any creative ideas that day. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you about it more in a moment. Basically asked if they had any creative ideas that day and the context surrounding those ideas and how creative they thought they were. The physicists were um, from a very highly selective um, workshop um, that happens at UCSB. UCSB has a, a really stellar physics department. Uh, and the writers were members of the Writer Guild. They were only eligible if they spent 20 hours per week 
uh, or more writing on writing related concepts. Many of them were screenwriters, novelists, and so <clears throat> some of their creative ideas would be like, oh, that's how I can kill this guy. Uh, in this case, they're killing off their character, uh, nothing more. Um, so um, we asked them first, did you have any ideas today that you think might represent a meaningful advance on any project that you're currently working on? Yes or no? Uh, we assessed the occurrence of mind wandering. We had two different questions that um, tapped this. First, what were you thinking about when the idea occurred to you? I was absorbed in the general idea or problem, so that would be on task. Or I was thinking about something unrelated to the general idea or problem, so that would count as mind wandering. And then we also asked them, what were you doing when the idea occurred to you, actively pursuing the project, working on another work-related problem, project, or idea, doing something unrelated to work, e.g. paying a bill. So either this, doing something unrelated, or this was defined as mind-wandering. And then we also asked them, was the idea an insight? Um, uh, we got at that in two different ways. One of the characteristics of insights is that they typically involve overcoming an impasse. So we asked them, what was the state of the problem that you had had an idea about? And uh, if they said I had been an impasse, that would suggest that it was an insight. And then we also asked them just, would you say this felt like an aha moment? And just asked them to indicate yes or no. Okay, and then lastly, we asked them the quality idea, how important do you think it is, how significant do you think it is, how confident, and most critically, how creative do you think it is. Um, the other thing that we did, which was kind of fun, is we contacted them again six months later. And we said, hey, remember that idea? Or you know, do you remember that idea? Whatever happened to that? You know, was it sticky? So we could actually look at what happens over time to these ideas and ask those same questions over time. Okay, so what did we find? First off, um, uh, we had very good compliance. Um, we had a um, uh, number of days completed. Um, 100, so about 13 out of the 14 days, people actually did it. So this is really a good pop. Our, our undergraduates are rarely this uh, diligent. Um, on 783 of those days, 62% they had an idea that they were rated. So these guys, are, they're coming up with ideas. Um, about eight ideas uh, per person. And when did the ideas occur? So about 28% of the ideas said they were thinking about something unrelated to the general idea or problem. And 20, about, again, about 28% doing something unrelated to work, e.g. paying a bill. And when you combine those two, 42% was either one or the other of these definitions. So, so nearly 40% of the ideas that these people are having were arguably uh, occurring during mind morning. So we think that's a pretty exciting finding right there, is that a lot of these ideas are not happening when people are at their desk working on the problem. They're happening uh, at some moment of mind morning. What was the nature of the idea? Um, about 13% uh, uh, involved uh, overcoming an, an impasse, and about uh, uh, so that's the key aspect of that one. And then here, about 45% were described as an aha moment. So they're having a fair bit of aha ideas uh, as well. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, the quality of the idea is the function of uh, mind wandering. So what were you thinking about when you had the idea? I was absorbed in the general idea. The problem is not mind wandering. So we're actually defining mind wandering now as both of these. So that's. That slide is actually incorrect. We're now either one of those is we're counting as mind wandering. So in terms of the quality of the ideas as a function of mind wandering, there was no difference in the overall creativity. So the ideas that they had when they were mind wandering were no more nor no less creative than the ideas that they had when they said they were on task. But they were um, nearly twice as likely to um, report overcoming impasse when they were mind wandering relative to when they were on task. So when they were mind wandering, they're more likely to have an idea that they characterize as overcoming an impasse. And when they're mind wandering, they're more likely to describe the experience as an aha experience. So there does seem to be qualitative differences between the ideas that they have when they're mind wandering versus the ideas that they have when they're actually uh, on task. There were no differences between the writers and the physicists. Uh, in the um, relationship uh, with, with mind wandering, but relative to the physicists, the um, writers were more likely uh, to report ideas that, well, that were mind wandering, more likely to characterize their ideas as involving aha, and they thought they were more creative than the physicists did. <laughs> um, now, the key question um, is what happened, uh, let's see, in the six month follow up? 
So now let's just pause here and think about this for a moment, because you can actually tell two different stories. On one story, if you are uh, mind wandering, I've already said that mind wandering seems to be associated with um, moraha, and that mind wandering seems to be associated with um, creativity. So you might predict that when you are mind wandering and you have an aha experience, that that's going to be the real zinger. That's going to be the one that's going to really <laughs> stick. And uh, six months later, yeah, that's when I came up with this big discovery, like you know the laser and those other ones. On the other hand, um, it's also possible that you could get confused about how significant your idea is when you're mind wandering. When you're mind wandering, you're not expecting to have an idea. And then so all of a sudden, this idea pops into your mind. You go, wow, oh, where did that come from? That must be a brilliant idea. So you could also sort of imagine that mind wandering would lead you to something which we've talked about before is discovery misattribution, where you're, you're feeling surprised and that you're actually confused about why you're surprised. You think you're surprised because this is a great idea. In fact, you're surprised because you just weren't expecting to have an idea right then. So those are the two ideas. One possibility is that you've got this um, mind wandering, enhancing the aha experience, a really good idea. The other possibility, discovery misattribution. What did we find? Well, it actually turns out we found both things. So, let's see if I can. So we contacted them six months later, and why? There we are. Okay, so this is kind of a busy um, thing, but let's first take a look at the writers. So here we have the writers, and these are the writers um, when they reported themselves being on task, and here are the writers <clears throat> right here when they said they were an aha. And what you basically see is, is that six months later, if they said it wasn't an aha, uh, then they um, were more creative six months later. And if they said it was an aha, it was, uh, they were less creative. And if this happened when they were mind wandering, it was extra bad. So basically, when writers have aha experiences, they're, and especially when they're having it while mind wandering, it's not that predictive of it being a good idea. If anything, Probably not, that's probably not the way to kill the guy, right? That's probably not going to go anywhere. But interestingly, now let's take a look at the physicists. When the physicists were not mind wandering, they tended to um, have, when they um, to characterize it as not aha, those ideas tended to be better than the aha ideas. But look, of all the ideas, the ones that improve the most are the physicists who um, are mind wandering and describe their ideas as aha. So it seems to be that at least in certain fields, when you have an aha during mind wandering, it seems to be uh, a really uh, valuable thing. Now, we can speculate about why this would be. One reasonable thing is that in physics, it's a little bit easier to, d to decide the, the idea. You, can, you have some knowledge about exactly how the current state of the field works, and it's a more uh, sort of constrained in terms of evaluating ideas, where in writing it's very hard to know whether or not that idea is really going to work or not. So maybe differences in the kind of degree of constraints in the two areas that mean that the aha ideas are going to be more likely to be genuine ahas in physics and relative to writing and that they're really able to come up with the doozies when their mind wandering. So physicists, whereas writers, rating of the creativity of their high ideas decreased more than those ideas that were generated in mind wandering. For physicists, ratings of the creativity of their ideas actually increased when they originally occurred during mind wandering. Okay, so uh, in sum, approximately 40% of creative ideas occurred when individuals were mind wandering. Uh, the, compared to on cast, these ideas during mind wandering were comparably creative, associated with more of an aha experience, more likely to involve overcoming an impasse. This suggests that mind wandering may be an important part of the creative process, especially for incubation insight and breaking impasses. However, after a six month follow-up, no overall differences in creativity on the tasks, but what we find is that creativity of a high day is during mind wandering went down for writers and went up for physicists. So general conclusions, anecdotal reports of the role of mind wandering creative discovery supported by empirical research. Laboratory studies show that um, mind wandering can facilitate creative incubation. Uh, individual difference studies show that uh, people who are high in mind wandering tend to uh, have a particularly more creative ideas that are of, of a ha nature. And the journal study shows that 40% um, of creative ideas occur during mind wandering, 
more likely to overcome an impasse, more likely to be a ha, but this can be a sign that an idea will go far for physicists or will fade for writers. All right, some speculative uh, speculations, including one that um, is just become obsolete, but oh well. <laughs> Mind wandering is a common trait of people with this. So, so here I'm trying to bring it back. I'm, I'm stretching, so right, forgive me. So mind wandering is a common trait of people with dyslexia, and it uh, enhances creativity. So the speculation is that mind wandering may be a particular source of creativity for dyslexics. That seems not too much of a stretch. Mind wandering is associated with aha types of creative solutions. So the speculation then is that dyslexics may be especially prone to these um, aha types of solutions. That also seems to be not that much of a stretch. This is the one which is a stretch. Uh, the value of ideas that happen during mind wandering are especially likely to increase with time for physicists. Dyslexia is common among physicists. I've now been told that it may not be any more common for physicists than writers, so this kind of ruins that one. But so the, the speculation, which we're no longer buying, is that dyslexics may be especially prone to have high ideas during mind wandering whose value grow rather than fade with time. And uh, this may be the case, perhaps, in certain disciplines. Well. Um, I hope you paid attention, but if you didn't, if you were mind-wandering, I hope you had your next big idea. Thank you very much. <laughs>